let's get started. Let me pray for this word today. We're going to continue through, the, through our walk through the gospel of Mark. And so, Lord, Father, we thank you, Lord. We praise you. We are so, so grateful to come before you. Thank you for, for allowing us to walk through the gospel of Mark. We have walked side by side with your son and, and disciples for, for almost over a year and a half now. Thank you for the good word. I pray, Father God, that, that the only words shared today are those words that you allow me to speak. I pray for hearts that are soft and willing to receive. I pray for the transformational power of your word to work through this message. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I want to share. The one thing that the Lord put on my heart as we continue walking through, uh, this is chapter 13. Um, Jesus has given a lot of information about end time, eschatology. And the one thing that the Lord's put on my heart for today is, is in this season of manipulative deception, anchor yourself on the solid foundation of God's Word. And why is this important? See, Jesus, his warning to his disciples then are his warnings to you today. Do not be deceived by the world, but be equipped by the word. So if we can stand together as the body and let's read the word. This is our anchor scripture for today. It comes from Mark 13, 3, 6. And let's begin. The signs of the times and the end of the age. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple... Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name saying, I am he and will deceive many. That is a good word. That is a good word. You know, I made an observation, I realized as I came up for the, for the uh, time of uh, ties, is that this side of the church is obviously the side who was all invited to the weekend camping trip. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of families, and I started getting pictures last night. Hey, we're out here camping. I'm like, y'all going to be in church tomorrow? No, oh, well, we're out here camping. We don't have service anymore. Bye. So obviously now I know this side of the church is where all the campers went, so... Thank goodness for them. I know y'all are watching this morning. So, you know, last week, uh, I shared, the last two weeks, obviously, I shared a lot of end-time prophetic information. I really wanted to introduce you to eschatology. Remember, that is the study of the end-time events. I wanted to do that, especially for chapter 13. This is what we're talking about. So we start to think in terms of the eternal perspective. You see, prophecy, it not only verifies the perfection of God's Word, but it gives us hope for a future with Christ. Like staying locked into this captivity mindset of, of seeking what's next, it prevents you from seeing the big plan that God has for your life. You see, once you put on your God goggles, you gain this internal perspective that life is actually more than paying your next bill. And where are you going to get your next meal? Like through this message, particularly this chapter 13, my heart is to equip you to be bold. To be bold in these times, to become bold in sharing Jesus Christ with people who have no hope, who live in fear, and have not known the amazing love of God the Father. You know, I'll share with you again from, from my years, my my 16 years, particularly in, in police special operations, our motto was, if not us, who? And I thought that was a pretty good motto for a bunch of SWAT operators and special operations. What I didn't realize back then was God was preparing this motto for today. This should be our marching orders for the church today. If not us, who? Bad. If not us, church, who? If we don't share the gospel message with a lost and dying world, who is? Y'all, there's no B team. We're the A team. If not us, who? So let's continue through into the Gospel of Mark. Uh, I'm going to go back a little bit to recap where we've been so we can move forward. But Jesus is going to give the disciples very specific information. And this is a word for a couple that I spoke to before service. Uh, they feel like there's a, there's a little bit of cloud. And I said, just ask, and he will give you specific information. 
So let this word minister to you as it ministers to the body. But Mark 13, 1, 2, Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple. Then, as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. And Jesus answered and said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, if you go back into our, into our YouTube or Facebook channel, two weeks ago, I, I went into detail on this scripture, but I want to mention it so we can go forward. You see, that had to be a hard pill for the disciples to swallow. Like they're looking at the temple like, this is pretty amazing. And it was pretty amazing by man's standards. And they're probably still thinking that, well, you know, Jesus, I mean, he's coming as an earthly conqueror to overthrow Rome. So... Like, why would he destroy the temple? I mean, he could use it as his office. I mean, like, really, why would the temple be destroyed? From an earthly perspective, I can understand that. But you see, the bigger picture was Jesus was declaring that, that the institutions of religion that were built by man would soon be replaced by a kingdom of relationship designed by God. You see... Jesus is going to move into an intimate conversation with the disciples. These intimate conversations is what reveals character. When he, in Mark 13, 3, Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, G, uh, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately. Privately. Why did they ask him privately? Well, most of the time when Jesus spoke in public, he spoke in parables. Remember, that was to confound those, the skeptics. And it was to draw in those who wanted to know more. But at this time, there's no more parables. Jesus was revealing his character through these close conversations. And I want to take this as an equipping moment because we are. We're in Ephesians 4, 11, 12 church. We're a five-fold church. We're an equipping church. This is a great example of how we should pursue deeper relationship and understanding of God's word. Like the sermon messages on Sunday, these are, like, these are based on equipping. This is to equip you, to encourage the body, to educate the body, your marching orders. But it's in the intimate gatherings of Bible studies and home groups that we really do. We gain a deeper personal impartation of the word of the Lord. You know, I'll remind you guys that uh, every Sunday, usually Sunday evenings, we send out a sermon study guide. And it's all the notes from today. And, and it's not to, oh my goodness, we got here comes, the, here comes the rehash of today's message. It should let you and allow you and guide you through the week to use that study guide as a reminder. If this message is gone by the time we beat, we beat the other denominations to the restaurant, then the, then the purpose is not being served. Let the word of the Lord resonate and stay relevant with you throughout the week. It is in these small, intimate conversations over a study guide or over a Bible study. And if you're not part of a Bible study or a small group, I really do encourage you to, to take the initiative to start one, to gather with folks. And you can use the study guide or, or goodness gracious, use the best guide, the word of the Lord. But, but this is where these deeper revelations come from, the deeper connections in our relationships. So let's continue through the gospel of Mark. Mark 13, 4, we're going to talk about signs. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? I will tell you that in the Greek, the word sign is simian. It is proof, evidence. In the New Testament, it meant extraordinary phenomenon. People are always looking for a sign. Jesus has the authority to, as a sovereign God to give a sign or to withhold a sign. But you see, we often ask for a sign. But what we fail to see is that what we're asking for is right in front of us. See, the Pharisees even challenged Jesus. They challenged his identity to give him a sign. They demanded a sign. In, in Mark 8, 11, 12, then the Pharisees came out and began to dispute with him, seeking for him a sign from heaven, testing him. But he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Assuredly, I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. You see, the irony was that the Pharisees actually had more signs than anybody, particularly in this time of history. Jesus was physically present with them every day as a sign of God's redemptive work. You see, the problem was Jesus was their sign, but Jesus was not enough for them. What I will ask you, is Jesus enough for you? Is Jesus enough for you? You know, I'll tell you that Lee and I counsel couples. 
And they're like, well, I think we're going to, I think we're going to divorce. Okay, do you believe that God created, designed marriage to last? Yeah, I do. Are you willing to go through counseling? Yeah. So we start the process, and then I find out a week later they've got a divorce attorney just in case. What you're telling me is that Jesus is not enough for you. You see? So I do. I ask this, not for condemnation, but but for correction and conviction. Is Jesus enough for you? In those moments when we don't understand why, are we willing to accept the word? This is where faith is formed. It's formed in between the facts. We don't have to know everything. If we knew everything, we figured it out on our own. It's when we're not 100% sure why, but we trust God anyway. I love when Asafi said it months ago. Do you love me because of what I can do for you? Or do you love me because of who I am? That's a good question from the Lord. I want to share with you. If Jesus is enough for you, then you won't have to go seeking signs. Signs are going to follow you. You see, Mark 16 tells us, and he said to them, this is Jesus, this is his commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow who? Those who believe. Those who believe. Not those who want to manufacture some man-made ministry, but those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, by no means will it hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. You see, Jesus did not give the Pharisees a sign because they were testing him. Jesus gives you signs to follow you because he's trusting you. So I ask you, why are you still seeking signs? Instead of seeking signs, let's instead seek his word. You see, what you, what you read here is when Jesus gives the commission, what does he say comes first? Preach the gospel. To preach the gospel, you've got to know the gospel. So cling to the word. Pursue the kingdom of God and the righteousness of God. And then what? These signs will follow. You don't have to go seeking a sign. You seek the word of the Lord. The word first, the sign second. If you will seek God's word, his righteousness, his signs will follow you. We've got a new puppy about a week ago. If anybody wants a new puppy, let me know after church, but don't tell Leah or the kids. But you know, this puppy, I'm sorry. (laughs) We've got a new puppy. I'm kidding. I love her. So a new puppy, right? So right now, I'm having a trainer, I'm having a teacher, I'm having everything. But you know what? After a while, that puppy started following me. Everywhere I go, and I'm going to tell you, everywhere I go, that puppy follows me. Can you imagine when you pursue the word of the Lord, that you are so steeped in the word of the Lord, and you look, look, those are signs. Everywhere you go, you can't escape them. These are the signs that the Lord gave to follow you. If you're feeling dry, if you're like, I just don't see it. I don't see it. Maybe it's time to press into the Word. Maybe it's time to press into the Word. You see, instead of, here's another equipping moment. Instead of spending your valuable time looking for signs, look into the Word to saturate your mind with His Word. The Holy Spirit will lead you in truth. Spend your time listening to his voice, especially when you're faced with confusion, especially when you just don't understand. Seek the word of the Lord. You have the ultimate GPS within you, the Holy Spirit. All you got to do is you got to be willing to open yourself to hearing him and then following his instructions. God doesn't want you confused. He doesn't want you in chaos. He will give you the guidance so you will learn to partner with Him through the Holy Spirit. We are being equipped to be a marching army for the kingdom of God. Marching armies don't run around in chaos and confusion. This brother that up here that's a United States Marine and a law enforcement officer, you look at that cat, there's no confusion in his life. He's clear-eyed and straight away. 
this is what the Lord's creating in this body. This is what the Lord's creating. And it doesn't come from confusion. So let's continue in Mark 13, 4. Then uh, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled. You see, in response to Jesus saying that the temple would be destroyed, the disciples asked two specific questions. When and what? What I want to share with you, do not be afraid to ask the Lord very specific questions. I don't know why we're so afraid to go boldly before the Father. Do not hesitate to ask God specific questions. You see, Jesus told them about a singular event. Simply the temple's destruction. But notice the questions that they asked the Lord. They were formed in the plural. These things. All these things. So you ask, it's like, well, were they not listening? Because Jesus is just talking about one thing. The temple's destruction. Like, what are they talking about all these things? No, they were listening, you see. Because now they're starting to connect the dots. Their plural language, it it reveals that they've interpreted Jesus' words as not just a single event, but a series of interconnected activities. They're getting the God goggles, the bigger picture. And here's why, particularly to the disciples, because of their Jewish background. We've always got to read the scriptures through a Hebrew context, through a Jewish context. Because church, remember, Jesus is a Jew. Jesus is a Jew. And these disciples, they're looking at this through the background of their culture. Also, their knowledge of the scripture. They are familiar with the Torah, the first five books. The Pentateuch, Pente meaning five in the Greek, the first five books. They also, through prophetic, uh, through prophetic scripture, they have an expectation of the coming Messiah. We have trusted prophets in this body. I say, I think there should be a line around the building waiting for a prophetic word from the Lord. This gives you hope. This gives you hope and anticipation of the coming days of Christ. You see, we're being equipped to see that these events are not just isolated. If you're living for the next thing, oh, I just want to pay my bill. Oh, I just want to figure out where to go to lunch. Oh, I just want to this. You're missing the big picture. Jesus is explaining this to these disciples so they get the big picture of God. I think about Romans 8, 28. God works all things for good. All things for good. But we see this little situation over here and we want to camp out over here. And we're missing all the things that God's working for good. I'll give you an example, a very practical example. Do you see, do you look at Tuesday's election, presidential election? Do you see it as an end end product? Boom, done deal. I'm happy as a clam. I'm going to get on with my life. Or do you see it as a a razor thing? thin slice of the bigger picture. I will challenge you to not get so locked in to the results of one event. You see, a small scope gives a limited vision. God goggles, it gives you an eternal perspective. See, that's the beauty of this chapter 13. Uh, I've had people, oh, I'm glad you're talking about the tribulation. I'm glad you're talking about, because uh, really, we don't want to talk about it because we don't really understand it. As believers, we should be so excited about this, about rapture and resurrection and the second coming of the Lord. It's a a promise made, and it's a promise that's going to be delivered. You see, Jesus knows at this point the disciples get it. So he's going to address both of their questions, the when and the what. Uh, Mark 13, 5. And Jesus answers them, began to say, take heed that no one deceives you. So Jesus is going to answer him, but what does he do first? He gives him a warning. It's a good question, when and what. If it was from one of our kids, it'd be why. But those are good questions. But Jesus understands that he's always going to give good information. But first, he's got to give a warning. Jesus is is about to sow a good seed. But he's got to make sure that they're, they're able and understanding that they've got to be good stewards of that good seed. You see, God will, will always give us the truth of his word. 
But it's our job to protect that word, to protect the truth through stewardship. Stewardship is caring and managing the resources and the provision God's given you. Are you a good steward of all things that God's given you? And I know the religious answers, yeah. And then I say, well, how many thousands of miles is your car overdue from an oil change? Because, see, that's stewardship as well. That's stewardship as well. I encourage you. I encourage you to pursue holiness in all things. Pursue righteousness in all things. We want good seed, good word from the Lord. Then we've got to be good stewards in all things of the Lord. Whether it's your car or your kids, your marriage. Always steward well the gifts from God. Especially His holy word. Church, don't treat scripture as common literature. Don't treat scripture as common literature. You see, they're asking Jesus to sow a seed of knowledge. But you see, even the best seed can be snatched up to stop it from bearing good spiritual fruit. We've got to protect that word. I'll ask you as a challenge and as an equipping opportunity, when you receive a prophetic word, do you record that word? Or do you hurry up and write down what that word was? Or do you walk off kind of skippy with a little good feeling in your heart? If your emotions are what's tickled by that word, then you're missing the seed of that word. It is a conviction because of the word of the Lord. That word speaks to spirit, your spirit, because the word is spirit. Don't confuse emotions with the good word of the Lord. I will tell you that Luke 8 tells us the parable of the sower. And when a great multitude had gathered, remember we said in the Greek multitude is what? Oklos, a confused crowd, a confused multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city. He spoke by a parable. Now we're talking about Jesus. A sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell on the wayside. Now I want to, let me clarify this. He's sowing seed. This seed is good seed. It's not the seed's problem because we know at the end the seed has the capability to produce what? A hundredfold. This is all the same seed that's being sown. So this same seed that has the potential in its DNA to produce a hundredfold, well, some of it falls on the wayside and it's trampled down and the birds of the air devour it. Some fell on the rock and soon sprang up and it withered away because it lacked moisture, because it got all happy and didn't, was based on emotion and not the word. And some fell among thorns and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it out. We hear the word of the Lord, and we're all motivated on Sunday, and then, then the word, then the world, I'm sorry, begins to choke out the light, the conviction, the decisions that were made on Sunday. But others fell on good ground, sprang up and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You see, these disciples are asking for good seed, good seed through their questions. And Jesus is going to give them good seed. Because he can only give good seed. But we, as the body, have got to steward it well. We've got to receive it and protect it through healthy stewardship. You see, God has plenty to say. I hear people all the time, I ain't heard from the Lord in a long time. Well, then you've not opened this thing. (laughs) You've not opened this thing. And if you don't have a thing like this, I'll give you this thing. I've had this thing since 1992. If you've not heard from the Lord in a long time, open, open this, open this. I guarantee he will speak to you like you've never heard him before. Do not treat Holy Scripture as common literature. God has plenty to say to you, but do you have the ears to hear? Mark 13, 5, take heed that no one deceives you. Take heed that no one deceives you. In the Greek, take heed is blepo. It means beware, to discern mentally, to perceive. Perceive is come to realize or understand. Jesus is telling them to beware, renew your mind. You see, spiritual warfare was going to be waged against these brothers. And where does it start? In your mind. How would their minds be attacked? The same way that yours are attacked. Through deception. Through deception. So when he says, many will deceive you, Deceive you in the Greek is planeo, to lead astray, to cause to wonder, to be deluded. 
You know, when you treat the Holy Word, Holy Scripture as common literature, you dilute it. You dilute it. When you go into this and you just read it because you got a yearly plan and you're like, oh my goodness, we're like two months out from the end of the year. I've got to start burning through this book. When you treat it like common literature, there's no transformational power. It will, it will bear the fruit in which the soil that you allow it to be planted. What I'm telling you is that when Jesus says, many will come to deceive you, in the Greek plano, you will be led astray. Not you, because you're a mature body. Christians, Others that are not as well equipped will be led astray, caused to wonder. Where does that deception occur? In your mind. In your mind. I encourage you to stop being tossed about by your emotions. Amen. Amen. By your emotions. We've got to be spirit-led. Spirit-led. Our emotions are so fickle. Can I say it for the fifth week in a row? Jesus is not your boyfriend. You love him on Sunday and he don't call you on Sunday night or he didn't do what you thought he should have done on Monday and you're out looking for somebody else. The only other else is Satan. You step away from Jesus Christ and you cannot cling to him based on your emotions. It is by the word of the Lord, it is by conviction of the Spirit. Amen. Will, emotions, will emotions come about? They can, they will. I cry like a baby when the Holy Spirit falls on me. But what the Lord is telling you is, do not be deceived. Renew your mind. Romans 12, 2 tells you, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Amen. Now, I use the NIV, and I rarely use the NIV, but I want this, do not be conformed. Uh, to the patterns of this world. It is so important that you realize this is what is attacking your mind. The scientific term is neuroplasticity. It means rewiring your brain. Your brain is, is pliable. It can be trained in a certain way. I shared with y'all that, that I was not a good student growing up. My brain had been rattled inside of a football helmet for years until, until I got to college and realized it was time to stop getting my brain rattled around in that bucket. But you know, I was not a good math student. But when I started my doctoral studies and everything was quantitative statistics, numbers, for seven years, study, study, study. And you know what? My mind was rewired to where I have a, an acute understanding of quantitative statistics. Now you say, well, what does that even matter? What I want to share is if a simple man like me can learn uh, quantitative statistics, we can sure learn the, the redemptive power and the transformational power of God's Word. Amen. What I'm saying is that your mind is pliable. Your mind will wire based on the stimulant that you give it. So if you're, if you're living on social media, all you're going to talk about is social media. What I'm encouraging you is to transform your mind. Do not be conformed to the patterns of the world. Some of those patterns are gossip and rumor. Mm -mm. Stick to the word of the Lord. Amen. Stick to the word of the Lord and you will know his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Otherwise, James 1, 5, 8 tells us, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. It will be given to him, but let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. That's a pretty powerful illustration. Those waves have nothing below them. You know people like that? White cap, majestic, powerful, roaring. But there's nothing below. They've got to be told the gospel word of the Lord. They've got to be anchored to the Lord. James goes on to say, For let not that man suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Like God's preparing his church for perilous times. We cannot be tossed to and fro like waves. We've got to anchor ourselves to the word of the Lord. In these coming times, we're going to be tested through deception. I want you to armor up against deception. Daily reading your scripture. Read your Bible daily. Press into the holy word of the Lord. 
Regular fasting. Regular fasting. Group prayer. Come together in small groups. Special operations forces accomplish so much for conquering kingdom territory. Break into small groups to come to pray for one another. Have accountability partners, your battle buddies. And look, men, man, we can be so bad about that. No, I'm cool. I'm cool. I'm going to figure it out. We weren't meant to do this thing alone. If you read Ephesians and, and the spiritual armor, those, those shields that Paul tells us, the shield of faith must, the faith must go before. Those shields, those actual shields, had these, had these hooks on each one of them on each side. So when the warriors came together, they would click like this. They would click like this. And those shields became a wall. And that wall became a fortress. And I believe, I know, because the Lord called me out of isolation of thinking I can figure it out. He's calling particularly men to stand together and lock shields. Lock shields for our wives, for our kids, for our church, for our country, for the kingdom. We are called to come together to lock shields. So Mark 13, 6 says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and will deceive many. You see, false messiahs and prophets, they have tried taking advantage, especially in the early church. In the early church, they thought Jesus was coming back in like a week or a couple weeks or something like that. Eager anticipation. And what these false messiahs did was they took advantage of that opportunity. I'll give an example. In the first century A.D., uh, actually the book of Acts uh, 8 tells us about Simon Magus. Simon the sorcerer. If, you, if you're familiar with that in Acts. But he caused great confusion and harm to the early church. He claimed to be the Messiah. He was a sorcerer. But you see... He amazed the people of Samaria with his magic. Now, fortunately, because someone cared to share the gospel with him, an evangelist, he, he came to Christ. Now, he needed a little correction down the road, but he came to Christ. You see, these false messiahs and prophets, they still deceive many. I think what we do, we try to, we try to, we try to put a pin in the time of, well, that was back then. Well, that doesn't apply today. It always applies. It is eternal word. It always applies. But I will tell you that what they saw then almost pales in comparison to what we see now. You see, here's Paul warning. For I know this, uh, Acts 20, that after my departure, savage wolves will come among you. We talk about wolves in sheep clothing. Forget about those wolves. I'm talking savage wolves will come among you not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. That happened then, it happens now. It happened then, it happens now. We've got to armor ourselves up. We've got to arm ourselves up. Let me give you some example of some savage wolves. You guys, I know we're all saying we remember Jim Jones, the founder of the People's Temple. He led over 900 of his followers into a mass suicide. Is that a savage wolf? It is. David Koresh from the Branch Davidians, 76 people killed in an armed standoff with law enforcement. Marshall Applewhite, the co-founder of Heaven's, a Heaven's Gate cult. He convinced 39 of his followers to commit suicide because they thought they were going to get on an extraterrestrial spaceship. And we say, well, that's crazy. That's the power of deception. That is the power of deception. You see, these modern cases might seem extreme, but they're not. They're not, church. False prophets and fake messiahs, they capitalize on people's lack of knowledge of God's word. I'm telling you, the, easy, the, the uninformed are easily led to destruction because they have no biblical faith foundation. You've got to know the word of the Lord. I've got a couple pastors that I watch and some that I stop watching. And they will say some stuff that is so heretical. You don't have to be a, a learned theologian to know that what they're saying is wrong. 
And I don't see anybody get up and walk out of that church. We cannot allow ourselves to be deceived. The only way to prevent that is to know what God's Word says. And I will tell you that even today, today, that Christians are actively being deceived. I will tell you that in this season, I've been telling you for the last four or five months, that there is a shaking, there is a purging of the pulpit. God's tolerance for, for pastors who are not preaching the word of the Lord, who treat this as a, as a form of entertainment and fodder for jokes and, and innuendos. He's lost his tolerance for that stuff. If you've not seen the pastors that are, that are resigning and being exposed, and I, and I can't stand the term moral failure, that is nowhere in the Bible. It is sin. It is sin. God is shaking His church. I will tell you, after this election cycle, He has exposed so many false teachers. I've seen it. Not personally, because I won't stand for it. But these pastors or teachers, I'm not even going to call these people teaching these woke ideologies. Telling the, the, the congregation, God's people, that abortion is health care. Mutilating children is gender affirming care. And that lawlessness is biblically progressive. Telling people that the Ten Commandments were back then. That they don't apply today because we're not under the law anymore. What did Jesus tell you about the law? He didn't come to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. Every word, every word remains Amen. until heaven and earth pass away. If you don't think that the church today is being deceived, you're being deceived. God's word does not need to catch up to the cultural times. God's church is called to go back. Go back to the garden. Go back to the original blueprint design. And Kurt, if you want to come up, I appreciate it. God is calling this church to return into a pursuit of holiness. Amen. Amen. Into a pursuit of holiness in all things. Look, I mean all things. All things. There's no cutting corners and nobody's looking. There's no speeding when you don't think the cops are out. There's no half-truths when you pursue holiness in all things. If the church is falling for tacky political campaigns and smooth-talking teachers and prophets, how are you going to stand when the, lawless was, when the lawless one comes? You see, all these examples I've given you, this is nothing. This is nothing compared to what's coming. Let me tell you, 2 Thessalonians tell us, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, and that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Mm. Church, we've got to share the gospel. Paul is warning us about the lawless one. That is the Antichrist. Let's not make any mistake. That is the Antichrist, who is not powered by greed or social media. He is empowered by Satan. Through Satan's power, he will perform counterfeit miracles and wonders to deceive God's people. Those that are not firmly rooted in the truth of Scripture will be easily deceived. What I will encourage you, because we are an equipping church, it is refined time. We must be refined by holy fire. Not emotions. By holy fire. You've got to be willing to allow whatever the Lord burns off of you to be burned off of you. Those little bad habits, those little moments where you'd rather watch YouTube than read the Word of the Lord. Let the holy fire of the Lord burn the chaff. You see, from Jesus' departure until His return, the church was never told to sit back and chill out. 
I've shared before that the warm spot on the back of your chair is not the contribution to the body of Christ. It is your service. It is your righteousness. It is your sharing the good gospel message. The church must be refined for revival. For revival. If you truly want revival for this country, for this nation, for your life, it starts in the church. It starts in the church. Folks, it's not good enough to think that we got saved, that we dragged ourselves down to the altar years ago. It's not enough to think that it's okay to go back to our old way of living. You see, this is why the church is called to equip you and not entertain you. Now, I will tell you, there may be a little entertainment because there is also joy in the Lord. But our job, my job, is to equip you so that you will not be deceived by the lawless one. So how do we prevent deception? Mark 13, 37 tells us. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. Let us be a church that stands unshaken, anchored in God's Word and ready for Christ's return. We will stand on the rock of Christ. We will not be shaken. We must take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in Jesus' name saying, I am He and will deceive many. How do we prevent deception? And I say to you, I say to all, watch. That is a good word, and it's a word from the Lord. If we will stand up and allow me to to pray us out. We're going to continue to walk through chapter 13 of the Gospel of Mark. It will probably take us through the holidays because it is that important. We know we do not move unless the cloud moves. So I want to make an invitation. If you've not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I ask you to not leave this church the way you came into it. I ask you, do not leave this church until you've received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And if coming up front is uncomfortable, amen for that. I will ask you to meet with an elder after, and they will pray with you, and they will walk you through this season. So Lord, we thank you, Father. We praise you. Thank you for the, for the fall of holy fire during worship. Thank you for the opportunity in a free country to honor the veterans that have served our country. Thank you, Lord, for, for, a, for a good gospel message, Father. Thank you for, for being a good father who doesn't want us confused, wandering about, bumbling and stumbling. Thank you, Lord, for for bringing us into an equipping alignment with your word. That we, as a body, that we we come before you in holy fear. Hmm. It is only through that obedience, that reverent love, that we can enter into close relationship. So I pray for you. I pray for this body. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray abundance. I pray a blessing over you, over your families, over the legacy of generations that you represent, whether you're the first link in the faith family chain or you come from, fortunately, many chains in the faith family link. We are all members of the body of Christ. Lord, I pray that you, that you impart a spirit of boldness over this body. I pray that you impart the wild lion of the, of the gospel message. That we stop being so nice. That we stop being so tame in a cage. Instead, we're willing to roar for the Lord. That we're willing to share the gospel message. Amen. Amen. Mm. Lord, I pray for this body. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to be a member of a, of a mature body of saints. I pray that we continue to press in and press forward. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.